Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today, we have a very simple video for you addressing a simple question. Should gamers disable eCores? Now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Intel has adopted a new hybrid core design with their Elder Lake architecture, and this sees their flagship part, the Core i9-12900K, made up of eight big cores, dubbed Performance or P cores, with eight smaller efficient cores, commonly referred to as E cores. The Core i7-12700K gets eight P cores with just four E cores, while the Core i5-12600K has just six P cores with four E cores. Now recently we've looked at how the E cores perform in games when called upon, so say a future game maxes out the 6P cores of the 12600K, how well do the 4 E cores pick up the slack? As far as we can tell, the E cores do reduce gaming performance when called upon, but in a situation where the P cores are maxed out, having the E cores will certainly be of benefit, though we'd argue gamers would be better off with say two more P cores opposed to 8 E cores, but that really only applies to gaming scenarios. Now this has caused a good number of you to ask the question, should gamers just disable the E cores altogether? I've also noticed quite a lot of comments from people who claim to have purchased an Elder Lake CPU for gaming and have simply disabled the E cores in an effort to avoid Windows using those cores for gaming. And this is true for even those of you using Windows 11, and you've simply told me it's not worth the risk, so you've disabled the E cores as they're not required for gaming anyway. Thing is though, Windows 11 should avoid these cores at all costs when gaming, so leaving them enabled shouldn't be an issue. But I've also seen some benchmarks and user reports of improved gaming performance with the E cores disabled. So today we're going to look at that with a 41 game benchmark. All games have been tested at 1080p, 1440p and 4K using the Radeon RX 6900 XT. I've just gone with the 12600K since it has the highest number of E cores and I'll be testing with DDR5 6000 CL36 memory on the MSI Z690 Unify. Given that I've tested such a massive amount of games, we won't go over all the data individually, rather we'll look at around a dozen games and then we'll get into a complete breakdown that looks at the margins in all of the titles tested. But please note, all graphs will be made available to Patreon and Floatplane members. Okay, let's get into it. Starting off the benchmarks, we have Fortnite, and here we find that disabling the E-Cores does in fact improve performance, though only by 4% at 1080p. That said, this kind of margin was a big deal when Comet Lake S was about 5% faster than Zen 2 under these exact same test conditions, so I have to assume that this won't be a meaningless margin for all Intel users. And then we see that the margin does come down to just 3% at 1440p, and although the disabled E-Core configuration was consistently faster, I personally feel that this is a meaningless difference. That being the case, we're looking at near enough to identical performance at the GPU-bound 4K resolution. Now, the Counter-Strike Global Offensive results are really peculiar as the game ran better with the E-Cores enabled. I wasn't really sure how this was possible, and I'm still not, but I went back and retested both configurations only to find the same results. I'm not sure why this is, but for whatever reason, the E-Cores help boost performance in our CSGO test by up to 10%. And for this test, we're using some pro gameplay. We're using a replay to test the game, measuring 60 seconds of gameplay. The results were repeatable to a high degree of accuracy, so it would seem as though you want the E cores enabled for this game. Now, a game where you might not want the E cores enabled if you're after every last bit of performance is Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Here we found up to 13% stronger performance with the efficient cores disabled. That margin immediately came down to just 2 to 3% at 1440p, so unless you're looking at pushing frame rates over 144 FPS, this is a bit of a non issue. Like Counter Strike, we find that the E cores actually improve performance in StarCraft 2, boosting the average frame rate by 4% and the 1% lows by 7%, so not a trivial difference there for the 1% lows. I don't really have a good theory as to why this is, especially given that StarCraft 2 is famously known for only using a single thread. Bizarre stuff, and I'm all ears if anyone has an idea. Rainbow Six Siege was up to 8% faster with the E-Cores disabled, though this was only seen at 1080p, where the frame rates are pushing up over 500 FPS. Moreover, we see that at 1440p, where frame rates still exceeded 300 FPS, there's really no difference between the core configurations. Call of Duty Vanguard saw no difference between running with or without the E-Cores enabled, so this game behaves as expected, and spoiler alert, this is the norm for the vast majority of the 41 games tested. 
Moving on, we see that the Division 2, like StarCraft 2 and Counter-Strike Global Offensive, plays best with the E-Cores enabled, offering up to 10% better performance at 1080p, seen when looking at the 1% lows. That said, as expected, the margins evaporate entirely at 1440p, and now we're looking at virtually identical performance between the two configurations. Next we have Age of Empires 4, and here we saw no real change in performance by disabling the E-Cores. In fact, if anything, performance was slightly better at 1080p, though a 2% variation is within the margin of error for our three-run average. Moreover, identical performance was seen at 1440p and 4K. Cyberpunk 2077 also saw very little difference with the E-Cores disabled, this time just a 4-5% improvement at 1080p, with no real change at 1440p, and then nothing at 4K. The Rift Breaker, which is a super CPU intensive game, utilizes 60% of the 1200K in the CPU benchmark, and that's total CPU usage. I did take a look at individual core utilization, and I found that between 60 to 80% of the P cores were being used, with the E cores working at around 40 to 50% capacity. So although there is still headroom left in the P cores, the game is calling upon the E cores, and this isn't how it's meant to work on Windows 11. Still, the results aren't too bad. With the E-Cores disabled, performance was only boosted by 9% at 1080p, and granted that is quite a reasonable margin, it's not as much as I'd expected to see when the E-Cores are being used so heavily, with room still to move on the P-Cores. Even at 1440p, disabling the E-Cores boosted performance by 5%, though we're looking at basically no change at the GPU-limited 4K resolution. We see that Far Cry 6 was up to 7% faster at 1080p with the efficient cores banished, but by the time we hit 1440p the game is GPU bound. So again, unless you need to push up over say 144 FPS in this title, having the E-Cores enabled is of no consequence. The last game we're going to look at is War Thunder, and here we see up to a 5% performance increase with the E-Cores disabled at 1080p and 1440p. But by the time we reach the 4K resolution, the game is entirely GPU bound with over 140 FPS for the 1% low. So unless you require more performance, the E-Cores just aren't an issue here. Okay, so here's a look at the performance margin seen across all 41 games tested. And as you can see, with the E-Cores enabled, the Core i9-12900K was just 1% slower on average. This means that overall you win some, lose others, and for the most part see little to no difference. The stock configuration, so running with the E-Cores enabled, actually improved performance by a 3% margin or more in three of the games, though I'd say the only really relevant result was seen in Counter-Strike. Meanwhile, disabling the E-Cores really only boosted performance by a noteworthy margin in three games, those games being Rainbow Six Siege, The Rift Breaker, and PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. So in total, we have just four games where the margin was 5% or greater in either direction. And that means for 90% of the games tested, it really doesn't matter. And that's how we ended up with a 1% margin overall. And for those of you wondering, it's really no different when looking at the 1% lows. Again, the stock configuration was just 1% slower on average, with just a few select games providing a 5% margin or greater. That said, there were more games that fell into the 5% or greater catchment, but the distribution between wins and losses remains fairly consistent with what we saw when looking at the average frame rate performance. Now, if we bump up the resolution to 1440p, we find no difference between the two configurations, at least overall. The only outlier here, again, is Counter-Strike, which admittedly did provide us with some very odd results. Then for the rest of the games, the margins are 5% or less, with 16 seeing less than a percent difference. And again, it's the same story when looking at the 1% lows. Of the 41 games tested, 90% of them saw a margin of 4% or less between the two configurations. So if you're a Core i9-12900K owner focused on gaming, should you disable the E-Cores? Well, put simply, no, there's really no point in doing that. When we did see a reasonable performance uplift with the E-Cores disabled, which only happened in a handful of games, we're talking about situations where the frame rates were already well over 144 FPS. Take PUBG, for example, which was really a worst case scenario for the E-Cores based on our sample of games. I hear the stock configuration with the E-Cores enabled was still good for 194 FPS on average. Now, if you're worried about giving up any gaming performance, a better alternative to simply disabling the E-Cores would be to install Process Lasso, as this application will allow you to force your games to ignore the E-Cores entirely, truly leaving them to handle any background tasks if need be. For those playing the Rift Breaker, PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds or Rainbow Six Siege, for example, this would be an ideal solution for maximizing performance.
It's also a bad idea to disable the e-cores, given that for the vast majority of games, they have no negative influence on performance, while in some games like Counter-Strike Global Offensive, StarCraft 2 and The Division 2, for example, they actually manage to improve performance. All of that said, there is something to the comments that I've been seeing from Elder Lake owners claim that performance is better in a given game with the e-cores disabled. While for the most part the margins seen in my testing weren't exactly huge, the e-cores did for the most part slightly reduce performance. So I guess the next question is, why is that? Is this simply Windows 11 being a big old dummy by getting the scheduling wrong, or is there something more to it? I believe the issue is due to the Intel Ring Bus, which is quite flexible with the new hybrid design, dynamically adjusting the frequency depending on the load. For example, with just the P cores active, the Ring Bus operates at 4.7 GHz, but as soon as the E cores are utilized in any way, the Ring Bus frequency drops by 23% to 3.6 GHz. And when this happens, the L3 cache latency increases by roughly 12%, and this is almost certainly reducing game performance. And it's why core heavy memory sensitive titles like the Rift Breaker saw up to an 8% reduction in performance. The thing is though, you really need to be heavily CPU bound for this to be an issue. As we saw, even with the Radeon RX 6900 XT at 1080p, most games are already spitting out significantly more frames than most gamers will require before a performance difference can actually be measured. So again, for the most part, this really is going to be a non-issue for gamers at least right now and likely sometime into the future. So for now, my advice is to use a program like Process Lasso where need be and then leave those e cores to do what they were marketed to do and that is handle background tasks. And that is going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed the testing, then please do give it a like. You can subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to become part of the Harbor Box community, then you can join us over at Floatplane or Patreon. Signing up to either of those will give you access to monthly live streams with Tim and myself, Q and A's, behind the scenes content, and of course our exclusive Discord server. Great community over there. So if you wanna go and chat with Tim and myself and the rest of the community, then yeah, check out Floatplane or Patreon. As I said, links are in the video description. But if not, that is perfectly fine, and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.